I've been given the privilege of leading off uh, this conference by talking about constipation conundrum in kids. And I'm going to also have my partner in the colorectal and pelvic health program, Veronica Victorian, uh, give some of her expertise as well. Our outline is going to be, we're going to kind of review constipation briefly because obviously many of you have a large amount of experience with this already. We're going to talk about idiopathic constipation. We're going to go into some of the new techniques that we're using in bowel management. And then we'll give some also additional new uh, protocols that we have for skin care in the chronically constipated child. You may be wondering why is a surgeon up here talking about constipation? And probably over about the last five to seven years, there have been some significant changes in the way that constipation, especially severe constipation, is managed now between GI and surgery. And I think it's all good in that the field is moving forward where GI and surgery now have multidisciplinary clinics where we're there with our medical colleagues because there are certain issues that surgery has significant input in and obviously there's other issues that GI does and I think being in the same clinics and the same spaces allows to have kind of free flow of communication ideas and you're going to see this more and more across the country as children's hospitals open these different types of programs. So why does it cause so much consternation in parents? Well, every parent expects that everyone can poop, right? Like this is something that after your child is born, your child is supposed to poop, and if anything ever happens, like poo gets stuck, then <laughs> it drives an enormous amount of anxiety um, with the families that I'm sure you know in all of your practices that the mother that comes in with a child that hasn't pooped in three, four, five, a week, is going to take up a significant amount of your time. So constipation is common. So the latest data would show that about 12 to 15 percent of pediatric patients or, pedi or children in general uh, suffer with some type of constipation. Uh, there have never been any real hard definitions of constipation. You can find a number of different uh, ways that people describe it, but it's common. It's also a reasonable health care burden within the pediatric community. It costs about $4 billion a year within the United States that constipation happens. And often these are hospital admissions, frequent visits into the pediatrician's office, utilization of other resources. So how do we approach it? Well, the first thing that we do if someone shows up in our colorectal pelvic program or any kind of bowel management clinic is we once again start with the foods. As is said in that book, Everyone Poops, uh, one of the main things is whatever goes in needs to come out. And if you're not putting in things that can help them use the restroom, then things tend to get stuck. And this is what foods that we recommend to families to help children that have, say, mild constipation. And this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a list that uh, we found have helped certain parents. These are also then foods to avoid. So this is a list of foods that we hand out or other programs also hand out on flyers or handouts that say, listen, you want to avoid, if your child is suffering with these things, these are the foods that you should also avoid with constipation. And so once again, not an extensive list, but a list that you know, is relatively accessible. So one of the main things that in children that also have constipation, sometimes severe constipation, is that we want to put the parents at ease. Uh, constipation does not cause headaches. It does not cause bad breath. Uh, your child will not have learning problems. The C that your child is making in class is not because they can't use the bathroom. Um, you do not uh, back up poisons into the bloodstream. We have also been asked those questions. And one of the things that surgeons often get asked is that a child who is significantly or severely constipated it is almost unheard of to have a rupture of the colon, okay, or of any intestine. However, in rare cases, constipation can be caused by structural abnormalities of the digestive tract, like an undiagnosed Hirschsprung's child can come in, you know, later in life uh, with significant constipation. Neurologic problems such as spina bifida also will cause constipation. Endocrine problems that you may see in your clinics can also 
have that type of effect. And then the use of medications such as iron, narcotics. In the post-operative period now, is if you see some post-surgical patients, you will realize that we really try to get away from using narcotics now. We really are just using Tylenol, ibuprofen, and many of the protocols that we're sending them home because we know that the narcotics can significantly affect GI motility. So what about severe idiopathic constipation? These are the kids that have been recalcitrant to almost the few things that we described in regards to diet adjustment. Sometimes you may send them home with Miralax, but they're still not using the restroom on a normal basis and getting backed up. The definition of severe idiopathic constipation is two of the following symptoms per week. And this was done uh, in a conference that was done in Rome, and you may see this is called the Rome criteria. Uh, it's fewer than two stools per week. If you have such significant impaction that you have fecal incontinence, uh, volitional stool retention, meaning the children are holding the stool in and you have a palpable fecal mass on an abdominal exam. And how does this happen? Well, you can get the cycle of bowel of holding your bowel movement. So one, the child starts to ignore their cues to go to the restroom. The stool then builds up, becomes very hard and impacted. It continues to build up and then you develop the overflow incontinence. So sometimes the families come and describe, well, my child's having diarrhea. And then you're kind of in this conundrum of, well, is it diarrhea, is it impaction? And that's when you get an abdominal x-ray and you see the large fecal loma that's present uh, in the rectum. As you can also see, there's this cycle, almost a behavioral cycle, where if the stool is hard and painful, the child is volitionally holding it, and then the rectum stretches and the child won't feel the urge to go to the restroom. And sometimes, even kids can develop enough anxiety uh, where they have such anxiety during toilet training that they won't go to use the restroom. I will actually admit uh, that even one of my own children had that problem. Uh, I have twin boys and one was using the restroom well during potty training, the other one wasn't. And when you have a dad who's a colorectal specialist and he's like on you about using the bathroom, <laughs> that generates a lot of anxiety and he actually withheld his stool for a week. But being that I'm a specialist in this, I fixed that problem. So. <laughs> So other clinical characteristics that if you see in your clinic can maybe instigate a referral to a more specialized program. Uh, autism, cerebral palsy. If you have a patient that has a dilated colon on a contrast enema, that may be something that you may want to send to the specialist because that is giving a sign of chronic constipation that that organ is dilated and needs to get emptied to allow to come back down to a normal size. And finally, if the patient has been admit admitted in the hospital, uh, for colon cleanouts, that's also often a trigger for a referral to maybe a specialized program. When do we recommend bowel management? As things that we've talked about, episodes of constipation that last longer than say three weeks, fecal incontinence, if you have chronic anal fissures, meaning they're passing very hard stools, as well as if they develop hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids in children is never really normal and that means that they're just trying to generate so much pressure to get out the stool that they're prolapsing that venous plexus that's down in their rectum. And how do we manage idiopathic constipation? Well, idiopathic constipation is this child who has met that criteria, who's failed medical management, or can even be somebody that uh, you're struggling with in the office through the normal uh, regimens that you're using. They come in for a multidisciplinary evaluation that we're talking about, surgery and GI, and then they go through a workup with a contrast enema, the GI doctors may do anal rectal manometry to see is this like pelvic dysinergia, meaning that their pelvic muscles aren't working in coordination. We can often send them to physical therapy to get pelvic floor therapy. You can also look at colon motility, like a SITS marker study. And if that's abnormal, then the GI people will move on to colonic manometry. And the final thing that actually is not here is also psychology. What we found, as you saw in that cycle, where it can almost become a behavioral issue, there are psychologists that specialize in kind of working with a child through these type of withholding episodes and kind of decreasing the anxiety about uh, using the restroom. So then we move on to what is bowel management. So bowel management is a way to keep the colon uh, clean and also thereby the patient clean. And these are specialized programs now that have popped up around the country where the main thing that is being used are enemas, as well as pro-motility agents such as Senna. And my partner Veronica, Veronica Victorian will go through some of the protocols with you here in a, in a second.
The first thing that we do is we ask them to keep a diary of what they've eaten, which is once again kind of what goes in has to come out. We really make them also keep a diary of the tip, the, their bowel movements, the timing of it, what is the consisting, uh, consistency of it, as well as any type of urinary accidents. If they also have urinary incontinence on top of fecal incontinence, that's a child that is severely impacted and probably needs a little bit more of an urgent evaluation. This is in a two-step process. First, we clean them out, and whether this can be done with aggressive like enemas at home or admission into the hospital. And then once they're cleaned out and we have an x-ray that looks good, we then move into a maintenance phase. The goal of the clean out is to remove the entire stool plug. And how do we measure that? We do serial abdominal x-rays. So we have an x-ray before the clean out and then we wanna see pretty much all the stool gone with an abdominal x-ray at the end of the clean out. And that gives an objective measurement to know how clean the colon is. So then it gives us a way to follow that patient later. And you can do it by medicines taken by mouth, enemas, go lightly, or even suppositories. And the maintenance phase then is we want to keep the stool soft. You want to stimulate uh, the bowel to, to move and to contract, and often we will use Senna for that. Or, and you can use some of the other, um, like polyethylene glycol, max citrate, or lactulose to kind of also soften the stool. So now we're gonna move into bowel management and my partner of Veronica Victorian is gonna talk a little bit about it. We tend to use a medica medication protocol as well as an enema protocol. And one of the things that we wanna do is that we always wanna keep the colon clean because then often this happens when the kids are toilet training. If they have a distended rectum, if, they have, if they're impacted, it will be very, very hard to get them toilet trained. And as we all know, that is by far a priority for the families that we see uh, in the clinics. Thank you. Okay, I'm Veronica, um, one of the physician assistants who work with the bowel management program. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we actually see. So a lot of parents would bring us pictures. We love that. We get pictures all the time. They send them to our emails. They put them in my chart of all kinds of poop in various forms. Just so you guys have a visual this morning while you eat your breakfast. Um, <laughs> If you see one through three, you want to be concerned, of course, if they're talking about constipation. If, they're, if they say it's loose like gravy, um, it could be still constipation, uh, just like Dr. Lee was talking about. So what we want to do first is try to get this stuff out, that plug, and then we'll move into that maintenance phase that he was talking about. So to get that hard stool out of the rectum, um, what we typically do is we'll have the families give a fleet enema or this little glycerin bulb. These are pretty, they're tiny, they're small, and a lot of parents actually love them. Um, so with this, you can squeeze it in and almost kind of leave that little syringe in there. And then you also have uh, the fleet enema. This is a, a phosphosodium enema. Those also help with breaking that hard stool up and getting it out so that everything that's above it will start to move down. Some of the myths that we hear about is that enemas will interfere with nutrition, that we're washing out all the good bacteria in their gut, and that's not true. Um, enemas interfere with normal process of toilet training. That's not true either. And once you start on rectal enemas, it's forever, and that is not true, okay? So one of the things we want to make sure we do is, is that we reassure the families, give them some feedback that, you know, this is not something that your child may have to deal with forever. If it is something more severe and you feel like you're having trouble dealing with it, then of course, then, you know, you can uh, escalate the care to a specialist. So let's talk a little bit about laxatives. Um, the goal, again, is to achieve one to two voluntary bowel movements per day. If they're pooping, you know, having a, a decent size, bowel movement once or twice a day, then we're typically happy with that. The goal is to have effective daily, like emptying of the colon, especially the rectum. We've heard some families say, well, okay, I'm gonna give my kid corn on Monday, and then <laughs> see how long it takes to see that corn come out. It's actually not a bad way to see how long it's taking for them to empty out their, their colon. Um, and then the goal, of course, is for them to have clean underwear. Some, we have some kids that are eight, nine years old that are leaking stool throughout the day. So if you have a 
something like that, then you definitely want to try to get them clean, get their rectum clean. So the first thing we try to do is disimpact the rectum and then determine what type of laxative requirement that they're going to need. And then if it's something that's surgical, then we'll, you know, consider whatever surgical management that we have. On the initial dosing, it's, it's really just an educated guess as far as the laxatives. Um, depending on the age of the child, the size of the child, anything is better than nothing. Um, and the, the dosing is usually way higher than what uh, the packaging will say. So some people will kind of freak out when they see how we dose. And then you want to um, decrease the amount of laxative. You can add water-soluble fiber if they need to, if they're having loose frequent stools. Um, if the patient does not stool within 24 hours, then we give them an enema to clean that rectum out and then um, continue with the laxative to help squeeze the stool through. So here's some center-based laxatives, and these are actually all over the counter. Uh, there's X-Lax. This says maximum strength. We actually just use the regular strength so we can uh, monitor a little bit better. We don't want the kids to have cramping. So the center can definitely cause cramping, so make sure you educate the families about that, that uh, if they do get some cramping to just kind of push through a little bit. Like wait, don't take them off of it because they're having the cramping. The fiber will help uh, with the cramping. And then some other ways to soften the stool. So these are some of the fibers that we recommend. Um, there's Citrusel, these Surgel, the pectins, these Metamucil uh, crackers. But the one that's the most popular is this Nutrisource. And it's flavorless and it, it just dissolves completely, okay? And then some of the stool softeners that you can use are the Miralax and any of the generic forms of these are fine also. They ask like, will my child ever be normal? Yes, they, they can be normal. If there's something else that they're worried about, um, then you want to, again, escalate them to a specialist. If they have any of these conditions, imperfect anus, Hirschsprung, severe idiopathic constipation, or any of these complex colorectal or urogenital diagnoses, then they probably will have more trouble with constipation uh, over time, so they may need a little bit more help. So some of the conclusions with what we want to accomplish is to make sure that these kids have some continence and they're staying clean. That's our goal, is that they're not walking around smelling like poop at school, on the bus getting teased. So that's, that's what we are trying to help them do. And then patients with these types of colorectal anomalies, they need close follow-up. A lot of times they kind of get lost to follow-up. So we've been working very hard to find these patients and, and see where they are if they need help. Um, just quickly, some skincare uh, recommendations for chronic constipation. With Senna, sometimes these kids can get something called Senna burn, um, and that is a, a really bad blistery rash that they can get, and they're big bullets looking um, blisters that they can get on their bottom. So if you see that and they've been on Senna, just know that it's most likely from the Senna. Uh, what we tell patients to do is to uh, put on a skin barrier if they start seeing any redness, we kind of start proactively. So we'll start with uh, cleaning the skin with warm water, putting on like a no rinse foam cleanser, and drying with cloth wipes if they already have a rash that's starting to develop. And then put a no sting uh, wipe or some type of no sting barrier on the skin, and then put the cream on top of it. So some people use Ilex. We use Sensicare cream. Um, those are some of the options that you can use. And then this is kind of our like, our protocol that we use. If the skin is bleeding or it's wet, you want to create something called a crust. And if you've spoken to any of your woundostomy nurses, they'll tell you that. Um, and the whole purpose of that is so that that, that area is protected and it can dry out um, and start the healing process. All right, thank you.